violence as tension rises between the United States and China. We look at how U.S. militarism in Guam, the westernmost territory of the United States. During World War II, Guam was a key naval and air force base for the United States in the Pacific, the U.S. now expanding its military operations in Guam. The Pentagon's 2023 budget calls for nearly $900 million to build a new missile defense system on Guam. The U.S. is also moving ahead with plans to relocate 5,000 Marines to Guam and build a new machine gun range near a wildlife refuge. We're joined now by Julia Nagun, a leading Chamorro writer and human rights lawyer from Guam. He is the founder of the law firm Blue Ocean Law and a 2022 Pulitzer Prize finalist for commentary, author of several books, including his latest, released today. He has now just arrived in New York, No Country for the Eight Spot Butterflies. Welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us, Julian. Um, we've been talking about the British Empire a lot, a lot with the death of the um, Queen. But you write about the American Empire. Um, it has more than 800 military bases around the world. Guam is a major site. Talk about your talk about Guam's significance, your homeland. Sure. Um, Guam is the ancestral homeland of my people, the indigenous Chamorro people, who have been there and have called that land home for over 3,500 years. We um, are a matrilineal society. We we value we have a set of sort of values that are our constitutive values, chief among them reciprocity. Um, we are directly in the line of fire. We are definitely a frontline community when it comes to the spread spreading canopy of U.S. militarization. Um, as I speak, my people are bracing ourselves for a round of militarization that is nothing less than cataclysmic. Um, and I say that in um, an intentionally existential way. Um, as you know, Guam is in the crosshairs. Um, um, sort of whenever the war games are afoot um, between the U.S., uh, the U.S. is greatly expanding its military footprint. Um, this springs from a 2005 agreement with the U.S., uh, between the U.S. government and the government of Japan to transfer thousands of U.S. Marines from Okinawa, which shoulders a disproportionate amount of U.S. military presence um, in its own right. And those Marines are now um, coming to Guam. And as part of that Marine relocation, um, the U.S. military is currently expanding its footprint in Guam. It is expanding its base. It has created a brand new Marine Corps base, and it is also constructing a live fire training range complex. And that complex consists of five different machine, uh, five different ranges, live fire training ranges. The largest and most important of which is a 59-acre multi-purpose machine gun range, and that is the range that I talk about in this book because it directly imperils a host of uh, our other-than-human relatives, um, including our endemic eight-spot butterfly. And, Julian, in terms of uh, this ex military expansion, clearly, obviously, geared to the rising tensions between uh, China uh, and the United States, all of this is being done when it comes to Guam without any involvement of the, pe of the people of Guam themselves. Uh, your Country remains one of only 17 territories that are still considered colonies by the United Nations. Uh, and uh, even the level of self-government, let's say, at some of the other former colonies of the U.S. or the colonies of the U.S., Puerto Rico, the Federation of, uh, of Micronesia, have received, Guam still remains in a category by itself. I wonder if you could talk about how the people feel of what is going on, how the United States treats Guam. Thank you so much for that question, Juan. Um, I think that it's critical to sort of uh, face that question head on. Guam is a U.S. administered, non self governing territory whose decolonization process has been thwarted by the U.S. government for 123 years and counting. Um, Guam um, has had a long history of fighting for the fundamental right of self determination. Um, I myself was involved in a decades long battle um, throughout the federal court system to try to defend the right of the native inhabitants of Guam to express our um, 
desires with relation with regard to our future political status, our future political relationship with the U.S. government, which has uh, which has failed, and is it sort of like um, right now what we see happening is the harms of 500 years of colonization sort of being exacerbated by a hyper-aggressive, unilateral sort of expansion of the U.S. military. So this is really—Guam um, is really a—Guam is where um, sort of, like, the legacy of colonial violence is now sort of being um, compounded upon by the sort of the harms of the U.S. government. And I mean that in, in every sense. Um, for example, in August 2017, North Korea was threatening Guam uh, with, uh, with, new, with weapons, uh, intercontinental ballistic weapons that would said to be reach Guam in 14 minutes. Um, in August 2020, um, China launched four missiles into the South China Sea, one of which, um, it's the DF-26, it nicknamed Guam Killer. Um, the U.S. government right now um, claims that it's sort of expanding its military footprint um, in order to sort of bolster up the defense of the nation. But we know better. Um, you know, with the war games are already foot um, out in out, out out at sea. The operation several different variations of war games are afoot, including operation. Valiant Shield, which is not unlike RIMPAC, which just concluded in Hawaii. And all of these war games, the, the sort of increased escalation. I mean, we see this at the congressional level with regard to rhetoric about uh, China emerging as the U.S.'s biggest pacing challenge. And we see this on the ground. And what this means on the ground to the people is, you know, loss of land, loss of uh, our preciously singular sort of habitat. Um, for example, the firing range being built now in Guam, um, it it entails the destruction of over a thousand acres of pristine limestone forests. These forests took millennia to evolve and are impossibly beautiful. And they are directly sort of, they're on the chopping block, you know? Like many of those acre, acres have already been cleared. Um, cer certain portions of, of the Retidian area, which is an area that is sacred to my people, have been already bulldozed. And so I write about that in the book. I write about how it's bitterly ironic that so many of these sort of machines that are ripping the, like, sort of limestone from the forest floor. These machines bear the name Caterpillar. Yet it's, it's that sort of creature's preciously singular habitat, these limestone forests, that are being bulldozed. You know, and I sort of land on this insight in the book. I, I, I finally get to this, and I realize that this is sort of what's happening. The, the U.S. is a country that prefers the routinely power over strength and living over letting live. And that, a country like that, perhaps, is no country for eight spot butterflies. I was wondering, Julian, if you could read a poem from your book. Um, sure. Um, I can read um, a poem that I wrote on climate change. Um, and I wrote this poem shortly after one of the cops. Uh, let me just find it. Sorry. And as you talk, I should say people should tune into our coverage of the UN COP, the UN mm -hmm. Climate uh, Summit that will be taking place in November in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. Julian, go ahead. Thank you. We have no need for scientists to tell us things we already know, like the sea is rising and the water is getting warm. The inundated need no instruction in inundation. We have eyes of our own, and besides, we are busy scraping barnacles off our grandfather's graves and other headstones drowned at high tide. We know how critical it is our coral reefs stay healthy and our mangrove forests dense. We will defend them to the end, not because some study shows they provide protection from erosion or shelter from storms, but because our reefs are adoring aunts feeding other people's children and our mangroves mothers in their own right. As you come to the mainland United States, your final message, Julian, as you your book comes out today, No Country for Eight-Spot Butterflies. I think that we have to be really honest about sort of this, this the U.S. war machine and that 
and and just like climate change, stop using sort of future tense. The crisis is here. You know, it's not only at our doorstep, but it's banging down the door. Um, you know, and it is time to end these endless wars, and we should begin in Guam.